Ladies and gentlemen, the program. Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalag of the New York Times. Welcome to Times Talks, our live conversation series pairing New York Times journalists with the brightest and most innovative minds in film, theater, music, art, literature, fashion, science, and tonight, technology. Our special guest has a remarkable story to share with us tonight. From his childhood in India to his current role as the world-renowned CEO of Microsoft. It's a story of disruption and transformation, driven by a strong sense of empathy and a desire to empower others. And it's the subject of his new book, Hit Refresh, the quest to rediscover Microsoft's soul and imagine a better future for everyone, which he will be discussing with tonight's moderator, the deputy managing editor of the New York Times. Following tonight's conversation, you are cordially invited to a meet and greet and book sale in the Roy Furman Gallery immediately outside the theater. And now please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Rebecca Blumenstein, and our special guest, Satya Nadella. Good evening, everyone. Satya Nadella is only the third CEO Microsoft has had in its 42-year history. And not many CEOs write books while they're still on the job. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, your book was published today in a global launch. Um, and we're very lucky to have you here for your first extended interview uh, to tell your own story and really the story of technology through Microsoft. We're going to have a discussion for about 45 minutes and then open it up to you for your questions. We are also presenting and taking questions uh, via Facebook Live. So thank you so much for being here, Satya. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for having me. My first question is, why did you write this book? I mean, it seems a bit <laughs> risky. Uh, CEOs during transformations uh, usually are a bit more cautious. Wouldn't this run the risk of looking a bit odd if it doesn't work out so well? <laughs> you know, uh, it's a very good point because no one, most business books, um, as far as I can tell, um, are these look backs, uh, either grand successes or grand failures. Exactly. Um, in fact, the inspiration for this, uh, you know, came from uh, once I went uh, went to meet uh, Steve Ballmer, maybe six months or so after he had retired, and I asked him, "Are you going to write about? Uh, are, are you writing a book?" And he says, "No, I'm into the future." And that's when I realized that, oh, you know, while going through this process of transformation, I mean, this is not a book about having reached some destination or achieved any success. Um, in the fog of war, I wanted to be able to capture the reflections uh, of the questions and uh, the answers, even if they're not complete. Um, you know, I think of this as a, you know, we all go through as individuals or as institutions or even as societies through this continuous process of renewal, right? That's where even the inspiration for this hit refresh comes from as the word. Um, and I felt that I needed to reflect on that and capture mm -hmm. that while going through it. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, if that is uh, what I had in mind when I started, uh, but I wanted to be able to have this be more of a sitting CEO's meditations on the struggle versus having achieved some success and a look back. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to your beginnings of your own story. You grew up in India. You moved around a lot because your dad was in the civil service. And you write that academically you weren't that great. And I think those are your own words. Is that possibly true? Were you really a <laughs> disappointment uh, academically at a young age? I, I, I mean. Um, I, my, my dad, for example, uh, was a guy um, who, you know, he, who would, has never met an exam that he didn't ace. Mm -hmm. um, so he would look at my grades and say, how can this be possible? <laughs> um, but the thing that I remember so distinctly is he never made me uh, feel bad about it. Uh, if anything, uh, he had very high uh, aspirations. I mean, he had, he had real intellectual curiosity um, and ambition. 
that definitely rubbed off on me. Uh, but yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, I was more into cricket than uh, academics. Uh, but the one thing that he did uh, tell me, which is, hey, look, a lot of people whom I went to school with used to think that if they aced this one exam, especially mm -hmm. the Indian Civil Service was one of those exams where uh, it was very competitive, and they thought, oh, once I crack that, I shouldn't do anything else, yeah. after, or I don't have to do anything. And he said that's the biggest mistake most people mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. because the idea that um, that somehow you pass one exam and everything else is fine is not the way life works. Uh, it's mm -hmm. about really how you push yourself every day. And in that context, even though I might have been, I've been a slow learner, every day I've gotten a little better than the previous day, and that does help. Speaking <laughs> of cricket, we have a photo that I'd like to call up here. Um, uh, I believe it's from 1984 from Hyderabad. And can you just, uh, I mean, I know that cricket is not as popular in America as it is in India. Could you uh, tell us, like, what drew you so much to cricket? What lessons did you, did you learn? Because you really were much more into cricket than studies for a good portion of your yeah, adolescence. It, yeah, definitely cricket is um, like a religion in South Asia, I would say. And, um, uh, and I was obsessed with it, um, and our school um, uh, was a pretty good uh, school team. There were p people who sort of graduated from there who went on to play a lot of uh, professional cricket. This was, your, this was yeah, I think this must have been in my 12th grade. Uh, I obviously had a lot of hair at that point. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, to me, one of the things uh, I think about, besides any team sport, I think team sports are so important because they teach you the importance of teams, uh, which I think is what business is all about. But there's this one incident um, which uh, I recount uh, in the book. Uh, the captain I worked for, uh, or rather I played under, this was probably the year before this picture, um, who subsequently went on to play a lot of uh, professional cricket. He, I, was, you know, I was a bowler or a pitcher. Uh, and I was serving up real trash one day, and mm. uh, he replaces me, he brings himself on, he gets the breakthrough for the team, but then he throws it back to me. And I've always asked myself, why did he do that? Like, mm. you know, he could have just replaced me uh, right. and moved on. Uh, and then I understood um, subsequently that what he did that day was to realize that if he had done that, he would have broken my confidence. Mm. Uh, but he needed me for the rest of the season. Um, and he threw it back. I did well, much better the second half of that game, and then I had a pretty decent season. Uh, that, to me, is one of those very subtle but very key uh, leadership lessons, right? You can't take your key people, uh, if they fail the first time, pass harsh judgment uh, without understanding the context, uh, what, was, what was happening. And to me, that was one of the lessons, quite frankly, I learned uh, on the cricket field. Mm. So, so your dad gave you uh, what I understand was your first computer at the age of 15. Was there a eureka moment when you, when you put some basic code in and, and said, oh my gosh, now I know I want to be CEO of Microsoft someday? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that definitely, the, the second part, no. Uh, but the first part, I must say, uh, the, the, the notion that software is this most malleable of resources. Uh, because I had never understood the power of software. Uh, I mean, I have more, better language to talk about it now than obviously I had at that time. Uh, but this notion that you can make things happen out of nothing. Uh, by just writing a few lines of code uh, was magical. Uh, on that Sinclair um, ZX80, mm -hmm. which was my first computer uh, programming in BASIC, um, was uh, one of the life-changing events. And subsequently, I got a micro I mean, an uh, IBM PC with uh, DOS and Microsoft BASIC. Um, and that mm -hmm. was the real life-changing event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got, you continue to, you write muddle along a little bit and, and kind of um, against some odds got a visa to go to graduate school um, at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And you flew, I think, uh, uh, to Chicago in 1988 when you were 21. Um, I'd like to queue up another picture, actually. I think this was taken in India before, um, before you left. Um, but you write, uh, I don't think my story would be possible anywhere else, and I'm proud today to call myself an American citizen. Why is it that you that this couldn't have happened anywhere else? I mean, it's 
I'm a product, I think, of two amazing things um, and two unique things about America. The first is American technology reaching me where I was growing up, mm -hmm. allowing me to even dream. Uh, and it was the enlightened American immigration policy uh, that let me come here and live that dream. And then when I think of that and say, where else would it be possible? Uh, nowhere else. It's just impossible. I mean, I think even if we were just we were checking, uh, there is more than p 150 countries represented uh, mm. in Microsoft mm. in terms of first generation immigrants. Mm. Uh, you know, the Berlin Wall fell. Where did some of the best talent uh, from all of those amazing universities in Ukraine or Russia or Romania right. or Hungary, where did they show up? They showed up in Silicon Valley and in the United States. So I think uh, that's what makes America exceptional, uh, being both the place where the talent comes, but also being the beacon of hope for the people who need it most. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think uh, it's something that I think we should hold dearly. Now, you've spoken out against the Trump administration's immigration policies and the travel ban. How does your personal experience affect your views? And are you worried about competitiveness? Are you worried that, um, you know, if it, in a sense uh, the world stops going to America, that this could, this could have a bad impact on Microsoft? And I think that's the lens through which um, we should view it, which is what is in our interest? as Americans, as our, our American society and our economy. Clearly, uh, I think that's what's of paramount importance to all of us. And our competitiveness, as you referenced, I think gets enhanced by the participation of the world's talent uh, in our innovation and in our economy. But it's not, I don't want us to be only talking about high-skilled immigration, because there's one other quality that the United States has, which is real currency in the world. It's that being that bastion of hope uh, for all people who need it most. Uh, I think both of those need to be preserved, and any immigration policy that we come up with uh, should really keep those front and center, because that, to me, is what makes not only America unique, uh, but also gives us the competitive power. Microsoft and a number of tech companies have uh, come up very strongly on the DACA uh, employees. Uh, do you have? You have several mm -hmm. dozen, um, and uh, are you prepared to fight hard to keep them? I mean, we are very public about it. Uh, you know, we, we definitely are subject to the laws of the land, uh, but at the same time, we will move the courts to make sure uh, that uh, the people who work at Microsoft, who are dreamers, uh, get all the support they can from us uh, so that they can continue to contribute not only to Microsoft, but to the United States. Another interesting part of your story is that once you came here, you were actually one of the rare immigrants who gave up your green card. Um, and at the time, people were shocked. Your, your wife, Anu, was back in India, and you were having trouble getting her here. Could you please tell that story? Because I think, yeah. uh, I think at the time, people thought you were absolutely crazy. <laughs> you know, it was one of probably the easiest trade-off, quite honestly, when I think back at it, which is I went, uh, you know, the way the immigration policy works is, um, if you're a green card holder and you get married, uh, then there's a huge wait list, um, and, and that can take years. Um, even at that time, in 1992, I would say, uh, it would have taken something like five years or something. Um, and I'm sure it's far worse now. Uh, so I went and saw this uh, immigration lawyer who micro uh, at Microsoft, and he said, hey, it's simple. Just give up your green card. And I said, wow. Uh, so how does that work? He says, just go give up your green card, get back on an H-1B. Uh, and I said, well, that's easy then, that's what I'll do. So I went to the, and then you can't give up your green card in the United States. You've got to go back to the country in which you got the order, you, you're going to get your new visa. So I had to go back to Delhi, uh, and I went um, and stood in line, and I said, oh, I need to stand in the special line uh, where one gives up their green card. They said, there's no such line. <laughs> um, and so I had to convince them that, no, this is, ex this is absolutely true. I do need to give up your green card. And then he says, why do you want to give up your green card? Because I want to apply for an H-1B. And, and that's yeah. when they said, well, this is crazy. How would you do that? Yeah. Uh, but that's what I did, and it worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, 1992, uh, we were talking backstage. is when you had your interview at Microsoft. Um, you'd worked at, at Sun, and uh, you were, they were recruiting you for your server uh, expertise. 
Um, you write that you thought that you just bombed the interview because of a question that the very last person who was interviewing you asked. Yeah. You know, it's one of those um, Microsoft interviews uh, which lasted, I think, an eight hours of coding on screen. And, um, you know, it was, it was taxing. And the last interviewer, uh, I get to the person, and I say, wow, I've done, it looks like I've done pretty well, so I should be OK. And the last question was, uh, what would you do if you see a baby who's just fallen in front of you on a street? Uh, what are you going to do? I said, I thought for a couple of minutes, and I thought, God, this is like some algorithm I'm missing. Um, it's like, there must be some trick. And uh, like, God, I don't remember reading about this. Um, and after that, I said, oh, I'll call 911. The interviewer gets up and walks out and sort of uh, sends me on my way. And on, uh, while passing, he says to me, you know, when a baby falls on a street, you pick the baby up and give it a hug. Uh, that's what you do. <laughs> and I said, oh my god, what did I just do? And I, I thought that uh, there's no way I'm going to get this call, the job. Uh, but lo and behold, I did get the job. You were torn, though, because you were going or thinking of going to business school, right? So, so you, weren't, you, you were excited about Microsoft and its mission, but, but you kind of wanted to finish business school. So how right. I mean, yeah, so I was leaving, actually, Sun uh, to go to uh, University of Chicago and business school. Um, and uh, through all of this process, somehow I got even convinced that, hey, if you're going to go to business school um, and not go to Wall Street, not that I have any uh, disrespect for people on Wall Street, uh, but if you want to come back uh, to high tech, why would you go to business school? And that was also pretty a logical question. So the person uh, who was recruiting me convinced me to defer my admission at that time. Give it a shot. Come and work at Microsoft. And that's what I did. And then eventually I went back through some strange set of commuting and others. I finished my business school. But yeah, I drop, essentially dropped out without even getting to business school. Uh, family is very important to you. And I want to talk to you. And let's uh, cue the next picture up, please, about your son, Zane. Um, your son was born with a severe cerebral palsy and has shaped your life in many, many ways. You, you write about how your first reaction was, um, if I may say, a rather selfish one. You were just upset, and you were upset at the, what had happened to you and your wife. But through the process of, um, of caring for Zane, you learned empathy, which is obviously a, a core, core principle of yours. Can you talk about the experience? Yeah, in fact, as part of even writing this book, perhaps this was one of the harder parts uh, to go back to and even understand in more clearer terms um, what a pivotal moment that was. And um, you know, it was one of those really hit refresh moments that had real profound impact, I think, on who I am uh, today even. Uh, I was 29 years old when Zane was born, um, uh, and both Anu and I, uh, my, that's my wife and me, he, he was our first son, and we were on both uh, uh, single children. Mm -hmm. um, and so the conversation was all about how do we get the nursery ready, how would Anu get back to her architectural job. Uh, you know, we were not thinking about anything uh, other than or, or the ordinary happening. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, you know, on the uh, 13th of August in 1996, Zane's born, and everything changed. Mm -hmm. um, for the first, even I would say, couple of years, perhaps, I, I used to mostly, you know, my career was taking off. I was obsessed about, so I'd just finished business school. I was all, you know, about, oh, what's the product? What's the technology? And I felt like, wow, this is getting in the way. Uh, of what I had uh, in, as my plan. Um, and it was all about like, what happened to me versus uh, understanding what had ha happened to Zane. And that's where I think Anu's natural response was. She gave up her career. Uh, she was doing all of this work to give Zane the best chance um, and driving him from therapy to therapy. Uh, and it's in watching her. Uh, she didn't try to school me on this, but in some sense, I eventually got schooled by just watching her um, and realizing that nothing happened to me. Uh, what happened was to Zane, and mm -hmm. what was my 
responsibility as his father uh, is what I eventually came to. Uh, and that ability to see uh, through others' eyes, I would say, um, is what is empathy. Uh, and definitely I learned it uh, through that process and it's influenced, I think, uh, uh, my work. Because I look at it and say empathy is not just a, a nice to have at work, it's actually existential. Because if you think about what a business does, mm -hmm. We have to innovate to meet the unmet, unarticulated needs of customers. Uh, that's the only way we can ever make progress. Uh, there's no way we can meet unmet, unarticulated needs of customers if you can't see it through other people's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some sense, I think empathy is what we learn through life's experiences, uh, but uh, it's not just what you do uh, in your life, but what you do in your work as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to switch a bit to uh, your Microsoft career. When you started um, uh, uh, at Microsoft, the mantra was a computer on every desk and in every home. And somehow along the way, uh, Microsoft lost its way. Um, you write that it missed out on both mobile and the cloud. How did that happen? You know, one of the things that um, I write about in the book is when companies go from being a startup to being a successful company, uh, what happens is you find that novel concept, the novel idea, the novel product um, that becomes a hit. Mm -hmm. Around it, you grow this capability. And of course, around that capability and product, you even grow your culture. So in fact, there's this beautiful virtuous cycle between the concept, the capability, and culture. And round and round it goes, until a day comes when that product or that concept runs out of gas, like everything. There's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. Anything that's growing at 100% will eventually grow at 50 and 20 and 10 and zero, mm -hmm. and then negative. The question really is, when the product that made you successful or the concept that made you successful is no longer going to carry the day, do you have the capability to come up with a new concept? But in order for you to do that, your culture has to support it. That's when culture is at a premium, right? It's not just culture reinforcing what you already got, the culture that allows you to question status quo. And when I look at Microsoft, 43 years into our existence, quite honestly, we've gotten a lot right to be here competing with a whole set of new people. 43 years after our creation. And in fact, one of the ways I measure it is every five years are we competing with a whole bunch of new people. Every year I've been at Microsoft, every five years at least I've been at Microsoft, I've been there for 25 years, we've had a new existential threat. Uh, it was IBM first, it was going to be Oracle second, it was Sun third. Uh -huh. And so over the years, uh, that's what I think we've gotten right, which is we've been able to hit refresh. If anything, and it's not like you're going to have, if you are going to hit every trend, catch every wave, uh, then you probably are either very, very lucky or you're not risking enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some sense, uh, what counts is the average. And when you miss, uh, what you have to do is wait for the turn mm -hmm. uh, because nothing lasts. Uh, and in our case, uh, even though we were, we, we definitely uh, you know, missed the mobile but we are redefining ourselves, what it means to be on mobile. Right? Our goal is to now have our software on other people's phones. Uh, similarly, uh, on the cloud, we may have been late, but we are the number two strong player uh, in the cloud and uh, really you know, growing faster than the number one player. So uh, that's what it takes for a company to continuously renew yourself and know that you're not going to be perfect. So what's Microsoft's biggest existential threat today? No, well, I mean, there is, the thing that I feel, and I write a little bit about uh, this in the book as well, is to not view it primarily through a competitive lens, because that's probably the obsession sometimes that can take you off path. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, technology today is much more pervasive. And people who are, let's even take the top five companies by market cap, we're all very different. Uh, we're whatever, number three. Um, uh, if, and we're not even counting the Chinese companies. We can even add them, yeah. and you will say there are seven or so companies that all have market caps uh, north of 400 billion. We have great balance sheets. But we're all different. 
Uh, I like to think about what is Microsoft's core sense of purpose and identity and business model versus just looking around and saying, what are the other six doing? Mm -hmm. uh, because the worst mistake I can make is to assume that we should do what uh, they're doing uh, and not be true to our identity. And that's where, going back to even our inception uh, at Microsoft, the first product that Paul and Bill created was the basic interpreter for mm -hmm. the Altair. Mm -hmm. This week, uh, on Monday, I was talking about our quantum computing efforts, and the thing that I was proudly showing was Visual Studio, which is our development tool for the quantum computer. Obviously, a lot of distance has been covered from the Altair to mm -hmm. the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. But our identity of who we are, we create technology so that others can create more technology. Uh, especially in today's world where every industry is becoming a software company mm -hmm. and a technology company, I think our identity matters even more. And that's what I want us to be true to. Let's go to when you were uh, named CEO. Uh, if we could call up the picture. You were, uh, it's a famous day in February 2014. Um, there had been a lot of talk um, that, you know, given what was happening, that Microsoft was in the doldrums, that there was no way that they could pick an outsider to be the CEO, that, that Microsoft really needed an outsider to come in. Um, did you argue forcefully within the company that you could change it? Or were you a little bit more of an unlikely choice? You know, I, I remember, and I uh, referenced this as well, which is, during uh, one of the interviews with the board, uh, I was asked, hey, do you want to be the CEO? And I said, only if you want me to be the CEO. Um, <laughs> and they said, well, that's not uh, what likely CEOs uh, say. And I remember going even to Steve and saying, hey, that's how I feel. And he said, that's right. Don't change yourself. <laughs> it's too late. Um, <laughs> and, and but the board, I think, did a fantastic job of what uh, I think responsible boards should do, which is look broadly and widely, um, and then finally did decide uh, to make me the CEO. Uh, but during that process, they asked me, do you have a point of view of what I would do if I became CEO? And of course I did. I mean, I'm a consummate insider. I've grown up in the company for 25 years. I uh, know the things that we have done when we got things right, whether it's on product or on culture, where we got it wrong, whether on product or on culture. So that has informed uh, all I thought of and was doing at Microsoft before and what mm -hmm. I have done subsequently. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, it is definitely not. Like some people sometimes ask me, did you have a clear idea that when you join, you're going to be CEO? No, not until like the day I became CEO did I have a clear idea. Um, but I do believe at all points, I did have a clear view of what our company can do and what I, in the role I had at that time, can do for the company. And that, I think, was the best training I could have ever had. In retrospect, do you think it helped you that you took on a couple extremely risky assignments? I mean, you took on the cloud business when Amazon was already very strong. I think you write, um, Amazon was leading the revolution and we had not even uh, mustered the troops. And you also um, then jumped into consumer uh, with the Bing search engine. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, and the, even this, quite frankly, I've understood even more ex post. This is the one part where I was thinking about what prepared me for the job. Uh, and it's clear that um, if I had not worked in these two particular areas, at least, uh, mm -hmm. because one of the things that working in our consumer space, I was running some of the larger internet uh, consumer properties. Uh, and that gave me a great appreciation of what the new data center looks like, uh, which was obviously at the center of what this cloud uh, revolution is. Uh, that's what prepared me for uh, our cloud infrastructure job. And that's what, in fact, Steve uh, led to Steve uh, moving me to that job. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, uh, what I achieved in that job and what I was doing in the job is what prepared me to be CEO. Um, but it was not some planned set of moves. Uh, you know, Steve was very clear when I went to run uh, some of our search and online advertising, saying, hey, look, this could be your last job uh, mm -hmm. if you don't do a good job. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I was intrigued uh, by the space. And uh, I do think that that's, that's something that I must say comes pretty naturally to me, which is uh, optimize for the learning potential. 
Um, and, uh, and then things do work out. Uh, and so to some degree, you can call it risk taking, challenges, but you know, that's actually been perhaps uh, one of the more amazing opportunities I got at the company. So your name's CEO. Um, isn't it a bit awkward? Because you're sitting there being very critical of those of at least Steve Ballmer and, and to a certain extent Microsoft's leadership. You, you said Microsoft needs a new soul. I said rediscover our soul. Um, because, Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> because as I say, look, I mean, everything that I have learned uh, is by observing uh, Bill and Steve. Uh, and quite frankly, I'm proud of the heritage of this company, right? I mean, when the history of business is written, there'll be a chapter uh, for what Paul, Bill, and Steve achieved. Uh, but at the same time, being that consummate insider, I have even earned the right uh, to be able to look at things critically. Um, and in fact, the best piece of advice I got even from Steve was, hey, don't try to be like me or don't try to be like Bill, be your own person. Uh, and that's what gave me the confidence mm -hmm. to be able to look at uh, what we had to do going forward with a fresh set of eyes versus any dogma of the past. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I wonder whether that confidence to do so came and the legitimacy to do so came because I was such an insider. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I, I, I mean, I don't have to be critical of our past. Uh, I just have to make sure that we learn from our past. You had this instinct that you wanted to bring Bill Gates back into the fold. Um, was that to get back to the roots? Was that one of the One of the things that was uh, important, uh, Steve was very clear that having been uh, the previous CEO, that he was uh, not going to be hovering around to see how I was doing. He had felt that that was one of the things that he wanted to be very clear that, hey, he was the ex-CEO and he wanted to give me space. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was very important to me um, to have Bill more involved because he's the founder of the company. And founders have these magical powers uh, in the sense of uh, just being able to get the best out of your people. When Bill says, come, let's talk about something or review something, I, I can assure you people will be prepared. Uh, and he will be clear also about all the ways they don't meet his expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's invaluable. Uh, his intellectual honesty, his, uh, you know, his ability to push us and show us the mirror uh, is something that I wanted uh, as long as he was willing uh, to give us time because obviously he, what he and Melinda are doing uh, at the foundation uh, is clearly a, a big part of his life and he was kind enough to give us more time and, uh, and that you know, has worked out very well. Tell us a bit about your early attempts and current attempts, really, to, to change culture uh, at Microsoft. You, um, you, you spent a lot of time on a mission statement, and then one morning sent it to the entire workforce. How was that statement different than, than what others had? Had Microsoft had a mission statement before? It's, it's actually interesting because when you, you talked about this PC in every home and every desk, when I joined the company in 92, we used to talk about that as our mission. Um, and it is clear, it's quantifiable, it's, uh, it's got a lot of attributes which are admirable. Uh, but what happened was by the late 90s itself, at least in the developed world, we kind of achieved that. Um, and after that, uh, we kind of had a tough time. Uh, we would have these marketing slogans, less so mission statements. Um, and I felt that's why it was important. In fact, the two things that I focused a lot on was that sense of purpose and mission and culture as the two bookends that need to be constant. And you can have ambitious goals. A PC in every home and every desk was an ambitious, audacious goal, which has a temporal aspect. Uh, so, and with every technological shift, you need to have those goals and strategies and competition. But the two things that can remain the constant bookends is your sense of purpose and uh, your culture. And we talk about our mission as being empowering people and organizations all over the planet to achieve more. And if you ask anyone at Microsoft, and I, you know, I, I must say this is one of the most satisfying things for me, uh, is these are not just words for us. They're living, breathing guides for all actions, every product we build. Like, I mean, you think about it. The products, the software we create, they think about people, but also institutions people build 
that outlast them. Mm -hmm. uh, we think about it worldwide. I'm a product of that. Uh, but the last piece is probably the most salient uh, in terms of our identity, which is it's not about our technology or our product. It's what did others achieve with it, mm -hmm. whether it was uh, a kid who used Minecraft to really build these worlds and get into STEM, uh, or it is a writer in Word, uh, right. or someone using Visual Studio and publishing the app that changes the world. Uh, to us, though, that's in fact ingrained in our business model, uh, but also our success depends on others' success. So that gets us into partnerships, which was quite a change in strategy. I mean, Microsoft had a tradition of being very combative and battling Google and Apple and court. Um, and fast forward, and you're spotted on a stage using an iPhone. Um, and you've completely changed the, the, the strategy, really, to partnering with companies instead of competing against them. I mean, this is something that, um, quite frankly, I learned at Microsoft. In fact. Some people forget that uh, Office was first built for the Mac before even Windows existed. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some sense, you all have to do is look back into our own history of how we approached it. We, we, we are a software company. Uh, we care deeply about making sure that what we do is available to users everywhere. Um, and so in some sense, it was a pretty straightforward equation, uh, whether it's Cortana on Alexa or Office on iOS. Uh, we will always support other people's platforms um, to make sure that the user uh, gets benefits out of what we do. Um, I, I don't tend to view things as always zero-sum. There is definitely zero-sum competition. We don't shy away from it. Uh, but we don't let that cloud the fact that we could have a broader opportunity if we together with some partners and compet competitors solve some unique problems that customers have. Mm -hmm. Uh, you inherited an acquisition that was pretty messy, the Nokia acquisition, and you write that you actually voted against it. Um, and then it closed five months after you became CEO. Um, it seems like this was one of the more difficult things. You had to eventually write down the entire purchase and lay off uh, many thousands of people. Could you talk about that experience and then um, what led you to actually you know, make some other acquisitions? Yeah, I mean, um, the. I mean, just to be you know clear about the facts and uh, in the book as well, I was not on the board, so it was more uh, Steve going around the room asking for opinions. Okay. So it's not a vote uh, per se. Uh, but that said, I think I when I became CEO, uh, I wanted us to have real differentiated point of view on how we're going to track, tackle this challenge of relevance in mobile. Uh, the first and foremost uh, uh, thing of importance was to make sure that our applications and our software, mm -hmm. our cloud, I mean, in some sense, I believe, in fact, the lesson for me is that uh, from the PC was that anytime anybody says, oh, we've figured it out, there is this ultimate device that's going to be a hub for all things for all time to come, just it's not going to be the case. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. uh, for 20 years or so, most people thought of that PC as that. And now, of course, every conventional wisdom is that the phone is the last device until it's not. Um, and so therefore, I always said, okay, having missed it, uh, being not number one or number two, let's go and make sure that we ride it and then look for the next bend. Uh, that was sort of a strategic choice uh, I wanted to make and uh, start taking a unique, different path. Uh, but in the process, it was a hard call, uh, especially hard because of the people impacted. Uh, more than any strategy call, the thing that I have had to learn that CEOs have to do is make these hard calls. Um, and having made that hard call, then you've got to carry that out uh, knowing that it's going to impact people. Uh, and we did, I did, and, the, and everyone in the company did everything they could to help the people there find their next play. Um, and, and to me, that was really uh, the part uh, around uh, Nokia as well as our mobile strategy. I feel very, very good. Some of the fastest growing businesses at Microsoft are cloud services that attach uh, to iOS and Android and Windows devices mm -hmm. because it's really the mobility of the human experience 
across devices. It's about the person, not the device. That's the secular shift that's happening. To your other point, we bought Minecraft. That is, I mean, I was coming from our enterprise side. The first acquisition uh, was Minecraft. Uh, and most people were like surprised. Right? What does this guy know about gaming? Um, but Minecraft to me was a quintessential. I mean, PC, I mean, gaming is actually a massive passion for Microsoft. Uh, Xbox obviously is a very loved brand. PC gaming is a growth market today. Uh, and is bigger than even the console gaming market. Uh, and so to us, gaming has always been important, and uh, Minecraft is the best-selling game uh, on the PC ever. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt that it is one of the top-selling, or it is the top-selling game on the phone. Um, and so to me, it was a no-brainer decision. When you uh, launched Windows 10, you did it in Kenya. Um, and this was a really important product launch for you. The a, a number of former launches had not been received that well. Um, and it's a tradition to, you know, hire. Come to Times Square. <laughs> go to Times Square, get the Rolling Stones, do, do some really cool things. But why, why Kenya? Um, I mean, you must have given up a little bit of, and here's a, here's a shot from that thing. Yeah, the, the school. Um, the, the idea there was, um, to get back in, um, in touch and telegraph as much back to our own engineers and our own product managers and our own employees uh, that look, we are a worldwide company. Uh, we operate in 190 plus countries, the products we use. I mean, if you look at Microsoft's presence, it's ingrained. Well, you know, we have a billion users of Windows all over the world uh, doing very mission critical things, whether it's education, healthcare, um, immigration offices of every country. You go through these passport lines that are running Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some sense, to me, um, it was very important to be in touch with it uh, and make sure we're not just building. I felt like uh, the entire you know, zeitgeist of uh, what was happening in tech was these uh, consumer consumption led, and we are not that. Uh, we are creation led. Uh, you buy Microsoft products, you use Microsoft products because you want to create. Um, and I wanted us to be able to sort of see that market expansively. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by looking at, hey, what are small businesses in Kenya doing? Uh, what are students in Kenya doing? What are multinationals with high mm -hmm. ambition in Kenya doing? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we did that. Um, you know, it is uh, as much as uh, to inspire ourselves. In the current political climate, CEOs have come under a lot of pressure to bring jobs uh, to America, and Microsoft gets more than half of its revenue outside the U.S. Is the, you're in 190 countries. Is the idea of a multinational company under threat? Does it need to change? I, I think that the idea of a multinational company is going to be foundationally based on what value have they added in every country that they operate in. Um, it's clearly, you know, uh, it's you know, America first in America. It's UK first in UK. It's uh, India first in India. China first in China. I mean, that's to be expected. And for us to participate, we've got to be able to sort of answer for ourselves and to every public official and head of state, what have we done for their educational outcomes, health outcomes, their public sector efficiency, their small business productivity, their multinational competitiveness. And if you can't, uh, then what, you know, what is the value that you bring? Uh, and to me, that's what makes, quite frankly, Microsoft unique. One of the things that gives me the greatest pleasures is to be able to, whether I come to the New York region or whether I go to Istanbul, I can have that conversation with confidence of what we have done uh, and how we've contributed. Uh, and that's why I think multinationals, that companies that have a virtuous business model that not only creates surplus for our shareholders, but is more importantly creating surplus all around, uh, I think is going to be the real currency for a multinational going forward. You acknowledge as you look to the future and AI that jobs are a key concern. Um, are you, is training the answer? I mean, you, you write that you, you expect three mega trends to converge and there's going to be considerable displacement. You know, the first thing we should 
definitely come and have a very concrete conversation on the displacement piece. But one of the things that I do feel uh, that is overlooked is the power of AI and what it can do to, in fact, create inclusion. Uh, for example, one of the things that uh, we launched a new app called Seeing AI. Um, in fact, it's on the Apple App Store. Uh, it's powered by a lot of our cloud machine learning and computer vision technology. Um, and I was uh, very recently talking to uh, a colleague of mine, Angela Mills, who has visual impairment. In fact, I worked with her very closely when I first initially joined Microsoft. Um, and she was telling me how it's changed her life because she can now go into our cafeteria, uh, read the menus, see the ingredients in products, walk into conference rooms with conference knowing that this is the conference room that she needs to get into versus barging into a meeting that she was not invited to. So that means she's fully participating as an employee at Microsoft because of AI. Mm. Uh, we recently launched some learning tools uh, in Word uh, which allows kids with dyslexia to be able to read. Uh, we, in fact, launched uh, some eye gaze technology, AI that allows you to type just with your eye gaze, super important for anyone who's quadriplegic or has ALS. So when I think about AI and what it can do, it can empower people to more fully participate uh, in our economy, uh, and we should grab hold of that opportunity. But we should be clear-eyed to your point, which is, Will it create displacement? Will there be automation that causes that? And so the answer to that to me is the first one which you referenced. Let's do our very best work as a company, as a society in education. Let's make sure that the boys and girls in school are being taught a relevant curriculum for jobs of the future. Let's not stop there. In fact, let's go to mid skills and high skills uh, even at the workplace. And in fact, that's why I'm very excited about LinkedIn. What LinkedIn does is essentially creates an economic graph and a digital feedback loop between the jobs, the skills, and the training required. Uh, and it's a continuous cycle. It's not a static graph, but it's something that evolves. And so therefore, let us use those kinds of mechanisms to help people continually upskill themselves or right-skill themselves so that they can get the jobs mm -hmm. of the future. I also believe we should not fall victim uh, to this fallacy of a lump of labor. Uh, you know, in fact, we should study the Industrial Revolution. Uh, some of the same concerns were there. In fact, let's not make some of the same policy mistakes, or at least take so long as we took during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and think about what are the new jobs. Uh, I see, again, I'm inspired by the Minecraft generation. Mm -hmm. uh, in a world where there is a lot of abundance of AI, what is going to be scarce will be real intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people on people jobs, digital artisanal jobs are going to be in supply, I mean in demand. Mm -hmm. And we should create the right wage support structure for it. So that's at least how I think we'll have to really think through it comprehensively, but there are solutions to be found. Mm -hmm. uh, before I open it up for your questions, uh, one last question on gender. You had uh, an experience that you write about where you you kind of stepped in it a bit. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, during an interview, wrote that it was good karma for women not to ask for raises. Um, what, did that, what did that experience teach you? And, and what is your view of what's happening now in Silicon Valley um, in terms of, of pay equity and, and really uh, you know, a number of resignations and uh, a sense of the sexual harassment that we haven't seen in perhaps ever? Yeah, I mean, it is a complete nonsensical answer uh, I gave uh, as I sort of recount even in the book. And because I was answering a question literally using my own personal experience without understanding the broader context of the question, uh, which quite frankly is unacceptable, right? For a person uh, like me who is a CEO of a major company, uh, my job now. Uh, is about creating the system that allows women to participate, for women to feel free to ask for a raise, uh, for them to expect uh, to be recognized and make progress. Um, and in fact, when I went back even, uh, and I talked uh, to some of the very successful women who work most closely with me and heard their stories, I realized that 
uh, I really had not internalized uh, how the system was not working. So the idea that anyone should passively accept it uh, was so wrong-minded, as Maria Clave uh, so uh, kindly uh, corrected me on stage. <laughs> um, and so I, I think I, I learned a very deep lesson uh, that one's own personal experience sometimes can be an unconscious bias. Uh, and especially writ large uh, at, at a society level. Uh, and so I got to work on what I needed to work on, which is to work on what are we doing at Microsoft uh, for gender diversity? What are we doing at Microsoft for ethnic diversity? What are we doing to not only bring people in, mm -hmm. uh, but to help them make progress? Uh, how, you know, we ha always had equal pay for equal work, but it is really more about equal opportunity for equal work. Uh, that is the real challenge, and we, how do we work that? Um, so those are things uh, that we have gone to work, and we have a lot of distance. And you brought up in tech, let's face it, we do have a significant distance to cover. Uh, in the last two years, at least in terms of the incoming uh, women representation, uh, has improved a couple of points to 27.7% at Microsoft, which is obviously not sufficient. In engineering ranks, where the gap is uh, higher, uh, we've improved by five points, which is good, but not sufficient. So every day our goal is to push, uh, and push to make progress, and that I think now I internalize is my core responsibility. I invite to take your questions. Um, we have Sean, um, there's a couple right up, one right up here in the front row, I see, Sean. Hey, thanks so much. Um, so I think an interesting common ground between a lot of software companies today is that they were founded by students um, and in the dorm room. Um, you think of Facebook, Google, and Microsoft as well. Um, what do you think are ways in which uh, big companies and institutions at large can leverage and harness the creative power of students? And also, what is your opinion on efforts that are currently taking place to do these kinds of things like the TO Fellowship and Dorm Room Fund? I mean, look, first of all, the entrepreneurial energy um, of students um, is I, perhaps the most um, powerful uh, force there ever was. And somebody in one of my venture capital fund of uh, friends was telling me, you know, you should really be on lookout for uh, you know, kids who drop out of Harvard. If they graduate, don't fund them. Um, and so I, I think that there's something to be said about it, and so to me, I, for example, I do lots and lots of college calls to recruit, uh, because I know that the only way Microsoft will stay relevant uh, and renew itself is to have people who come with fresh set of ideas, who are risk on, who are, who are willing to tell the CEO to buzz off and say, here is what the right product to build or the right technology to bet on. Uh, but so th I think our competitiveness as a country, any country that is trying to really capitalize on the human capital, uh, needs to infuse uh, uh, you know, more of these tech skills into that class and give them even the capital uh, required. And I think in the US, we definitely have that structure. Uh, you can, as I said, graduate and get the funding to create companies. And it's a lot, you know, like when I think about the capital required to start up something today, especially because of the cloud, uh, it's come down dramatically. It's not, no longer what it was even when I started uh, in the workforce. So I think the, the, the secular changes are right behind anyone with high ambition to be able to do anything at this point. We have a number of questions from Facebook Live. Um, Jonathan from Facebook asks, what is the hardest decision you've had to make personally or professionally? I think the, uh, the hardest decisions are always, at least as a CEO, I would say that ones that weigh the most on you are things that are these restructurings. Uh, and restructurings not as capital allocation or uh, on some abstract level, but things that impact people. Um, they're not easy uh, because we're all human and, um, and, and to be able to I mean, I do believe CEOs have to make hard calls. Somebody even asked me the harsh question, which is, hey, you talk about empathy. How can you be an empathetic leader 
uh, and then lay people. Uh, lay people off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've thought deeply about that, and it's hard because, in some sense, I've come to realize that if you, in fact, I was thinking about the 100,000 people at Microsoft and the future for that, our entire company, uh, and then carrying out these restructurings uh, such that you know we do that uh, with dignity for the people and then they really help them find their next level. I mean, that, that, those are the hardest ones. Quite frankly, business strategy and you know, doing collaborations, getting in and out of things and so on uh, are hard, uh, but nothing as hard as this. Mm -hmm. um, question in the front row. Hi there, my name is Arjun, like Argentina without the Tina. Uh, <laughs> my question to you is um, the role of mentors, you talk about people, who's the one person that you would say <clears throat> you owe your career to as someone who's been a good mentor to you? And the reason I ask that is because I've done two venture back companies since I was a teenager. Um, would love to talk to you about one of the ones I'm working on now. <laughs> However, every single time I've received a check, I've gained a new father, a new mother, essentially, in that relationship, someone who has had a profound effect on me who was it for you? Or That's a great, uh, I mean, I've been blessed in that sense um, with the leaders. I mean, we talked a lot about uh, Steve and Bill and what they meant uh, uh, to me, and uh, clearly I've learned a ton from them. And um, the one person, uh, this is something that I recount even in the book, uh, who had a very profound impact um, on my outlook uh, was a gentleman by the name of uh, Doug Burgum. He happens to be the governor of North Dakota right now. Um, he had said something to me. I was probably in my mid-30s, uh, and uh, he said, look, you know, you're going to end up spending more time at Microsoft than with your kids. And when he first said it, I didn't know what he was saying and why he was saying it. Uh, and he went on to say that f you better figure out a way for work to have deeper meaning. And that has been something that I would say over the period of the last 15, 20 years even, uh, really changed uh, how I myself get satisfaction in my job, uh, not just now, but all through. And then also what I want everyone in the company to feel. Like I, I sometimes think that you know, the best way to think about working at Microsoft is to think of Microsoft as a platform that works for you, for you to be able to go after the passions that you have. Uh, versus the other way around. Um, and so these you know, world views that some of these mentors uh, can give you uh, to not only have a profound, I mean, you, they can help you pick well, guide you well on critical decisions, but a mental framework sometimes or a mindset shift is probably more powerful. And at least in my case, uh, whether it was Jeff Rakes or uh, Kevin Johnson, whom I worked for, who's actually the CEO of Starbucks now, um, or Doug Burgum uh, have all been uh, amazing leaders uh, that who have influenced how I, uh, I think and also uh, how I operate. And just to jump in here, we talked about your dad. Your mom was perhaps an even more profound influence. Can you just yeah, quickly a, talk about her, her I've, views? I've thought a lot lately. I lost my mother uh, two years ago. Um, and, uh, and as part of writing this book even, um, I've thought a lot about the choices she had to make, uh, just like how Anu, my wife, uh, and the choices she had to make. Uh, my mom was a Sanskrit professor, and my dad was a civil servant, uh, and his job would take him to different places. Um, and so she uh, tried to really continue her profession for a long time. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, she couldn't, because uh, when she took a break with my birth and uh, my sister's birth, um, uh, she was not given that opportunity to get back into the workforce, uh, which I think is one of the challenges uh, mm -hmm. that women face uh, mm -hmm. when they have to take the break uh, and get back into the workforce. Uh, but one of the great influences of hers was she perhaps more than anybody else helped me realize that Look, you may have high ambition, which I got from my dad in terms of at least intellectual curiosity, even if I was academically not that great. Um, the thing that I did get from my mother was to be able to live in the moment, uh, not in a trivial way, but in a way to deeply learn, enjoy, uh, be in touch with what was happening. Um, and the more I think about it, that skill perhaps is more important than just having 
curiosity. Uh, curiosity and ambition uh, are important to do anything, but if you are not able to, like, you know, when I say uh, I was not waiting to become CEO to do my best work, I think I learned that from my mother. Any other questions? Ooh, a lot. Hi, um, I'm very curious. You, as an active sports person, myself, I'm an active sports person. What do you think of this whole new e-gaming, e-sports, and how how do you think about that? Because the it's there's not a lot of activity, it seems to me, that's going on in that. And where do you think that's going to go? E-cricket. <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, here's the way I look at it. Uh, I don't think the comparison of esports should be to active sports. The comparison of esports should be watching a lot more of um, uh, online video. Uh, the real zero sum, if you want to think about it, or the market definition, if you look at what's happening, we have a product called or a service called Mixer, uh, which is game watching. Um, and it's, in fact, one of the interesting attributes of that is it's interactive even. Um, and uh, when I look at it, what people do, it's fascinating. It's, of course, used for gaming, uh, but you can even watch people paint, people code. Um, and so it's become now a broadcast, uh, um, essentially, medium for all kinds of activity and people participating and watching uh, and even directing. Uh, and so to me, uh, I think that that's more fun, or at least it gets out uh, more creativity uh, than watching one more show that you don't have time for. Um, and so therefore, I'm all into eSports and, um, and things like um, you know, game streaming with interactivity as alternative forms of active entertainment, if there is such a category. Another question from Facebook Live from Donna. How do you think robotics will impact Microsoft's business and workforce in the next 10 years? Uh, I think that the place where robotics is having the profound impact is in, um, in, in, the, in, in the industrial setting mm -hmm. um, and the industrial robots and in logistics. Um, that's where I think uh, the impact of the robots will be most felt. But I think the broader question will be, again, this notion of AI. Uh, when you think about AI, you can broadly think of three levels of AI, or three simple ways to uh, comprehend it. Can we build AI that's better than humans in perception, which is can it hear, see, recognize? Uh, that's, I think, something that we have really made tremendous amount of progress in the last five years, and you see it. Uh, in all of the speech recognition, commodity cameras that can detect mm -hmm. objects. Um, the next is cognition, um, and that is the ability to think and solve problems in novel ways. And I think we now are at the place where you can do that at least in, you know, in certain domains. Mm -hmm. We don't have the ability to take learning in one space and apply it more generally like humans do. Uh, but although even that, I think, is something that we're making progress on. The last is the ability to act, to uh, move. Uh, that's where a lot of what's happening with self-driving cars uh, is probably setting the pace even, or what it, it's, it's, it's really a robot on wheels. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, we are going to make progress on all of these three. They're going to have profound impacts uh, at Microsoft or elsewhere in terms of the jobs we do. Uh, but the key place I think we should focus on is how do we evolve uh, our jobs so that they go along with the machines? What new jobs will get created uh, as these new machines get created? Um, you know, as there are more autonomous drones, there is such a thing as controlling those autonomous drones. Uh, who does that job? Uh, I think that's at least how the impact will be. Another question um, right there. Hi, thank you. Um, so you oversee a lot of different teams that create products that allow people to communicate, whether it's Skype or Outlook or Mixer and Xbox Live. I mean, we could be here for a long time. But my question is, how do you think about balancing people's right to express themselves and the sort of benefits that come from doing that, um, even if they're controversial ideas, 
um, with protecting people and protecting the spread of uh, false or misleading information? That's a great question. I mean, I think um, the thing that is required on a lot of these uh, around uh, being a platform for free speech and making sure uh, that what borders on hate speech is not uh, on your platform or uh, balancing the need for national security uh, and privacy. These are all tough, uh, tough uh, issues. But for us as technology companies and technology platform providers, especially around communications, you've got to have a principled stance. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the way uh, we have at least, uh, you know, tried to work the issue around national security and privacy, uh, we have a case uh, that's, I think, going to go to the Supreme Court um, around the jurisdictional rights uh, of the government on data that's not stored in uh, the boundaries of the United States. Uh, it's an important case. It's going to be precedent setting. Um, we believe that the privacy of whether it's an individual or an organization needs to be protected. And the conditions under which it is not should be transparent. Uh, therefore, that means there needs to be a framework of law, uh, ultimately, uh, that the legislative process slash courts have to come up with. Uh, but until such a time, we will take principal stands on all of these issues uh, around uh, security and privacy. And we will always err on the side of um, ensuring the liberties of individuals. Uh, that, I think, is how we will approach it. But I'm also very clear that uh, we are not elected officials. Uh, we don't have a mandate. Uh, and so therefore, we also will welcome the legislative process to work uh, on behalf of the citizens. And not just in one country, and this is sometimes what is missed, uh, is the, the, the web, the internet, and digital technology, in some sense, has needs new laws that even understand that information does flow freely. Uh, and so there needs to be an equilibrium, especially between the US and the EU, uh, and with China. Uh, and that then can set precedent for the rest of the world. So it sounds like, and we have to wrap up here, but it sounds like you expect, to a certain degree, greater regulation of tech, whether it's the privacy law in Europe and... I mean, GDPR, for example, uh, that's the European law on privacy, is uh, something that we are working on. So it's not something that we expect we are living uh, with laws that protect privacy. And uh, I believe it's going to essentially be de facto the standard for privacy all over the world. Uh, so to me, uh, we should, wherever there are laws like that that are being formed, do set the, a yardstick for us. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have to wait for regulation. Uh, we have to do what is right based on these uh, uh, enduring values and principles. Well, we are out of time. Sacha has kindly uh, volunteered to sign books um, after the event. I have like, one last question from Facebook Live. Um, how did you find time to write a book as, and still be CEO? <laughs> well, you know, I had help. Okay. Let's say. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.